Hi, and welcome to another edition of the Media Twits. I'm Mark Glazer, Executive Editor of PBS Media Shift. Today we'll be talking about blended learning, a mix of in-person classroom work and online and computer work done in classes in order to kind of change the equation for the way education works. Are the days of big lectures over? And will more students be using online resources as part of the classwork? We'll be talking about that and how that fits into the future of education. Um, first, I want to thank our sponsors for the podcast, Squarespace, providing everything you need to create an exceptional website for you and your business. Squarespace gives you beautiful templates, an easy interface, and even a free domain name. Try Squarespace for free at squarespace.com slash mediashift and save 10% when you use the offer code mediashift. The podcast is also hosted and sponsored by NextSpace and Next Kids Potrero Hill in San Francisco, offering co-working space and adjacent daycare for infants and toddlers. Learn more about their pioneering program at bit.ly slash nextspace ph. And learn more about NextSpace co-working spaces around the country at nextspace.us. And I'm indeed at NextSpace right now. My, uh, my baby Everett is here as well a couple days a week. So it's, uh, it's a great thing having uh, workspace and kid space right next to each other. Um, so let's talk about um, blended learning. Um, this is a mix, uh, a new way of doing classes. We've heard a lot about MOOCs and these kind of massive online courses, um, but this blended or hybrid learning is really the idea of taking the best of both worlds, of having in person with uh, a professor, with other students, but also having some online components mixed in, um, whether it's more online, less online, whether it's on social media or in other places. Um, it's basically trying to mix this online and the, the blend of online and offline. Um, before we get into the discussion, I want to um, introduce our panel. We've got Andrew Lee from American University, Katie Culver, our EdShift curator, University of Wisconsin, Mark Johnson at the University of Georgia as well. Um, you know, blended learning, it's something that's been around since probably the 60s, if you think about using mainframes and kind of older computers um, to try to teach people things. Is this, this seems like another one of these words like native advertising, where it's just become kind of a buzzword, taking something old and making it new again. Katie, what's your thought about why is blended learning, I mean, is this something new? Is there something new about it? Why has it become such a big thing now in education? Well, I think it's partly a big thing because so many more people are doing it. People are waking up to the advantages. They have new tools. Also, the price of the tools has gone down radically. You know, I'm, I'm sitting here with more computing power than used to be contained in, a, in an entire building at the University of Wisconsin in the 60s. So um, we, have, we have accessibility to tools. We have um, a rise, actually, in a, on a lot of campuses of instructional designers, so non-faculty who are helping to facilitate these kinds of things. And I think that's really helping. But I agree with you that it, there is the, the tendency toward buzzword and also uh, sort of the bandwagon effect. We have to be sure that we're, we're doing these things well, not just doing them. Yeah, and I also want to say, we, Katie, you've helped kind of curate. We've had a special all week on MediaShift um, on blended learning, and you can go check out that series at bit.ly slash blended shift um, to see all the stories in that, in that series. Um, and what was it like putting together that series? I mean, did you feel like this is, this is the time to talk about it? This is really a moment in blended learning? I, I feel like it's a moment to capture people who aren't yet doing it because it's gotten so much easier and it is, we are starting to see more campuses supporting it. Uh, the fascinating thing to me is I've been doing blended learning since I started teaching in 2000 and I learn new stuff in the series. So, uh, so it just goes to show that any problem you have, there are emerging solutions all the time and you can continue to develop and grow. I also think um, I learned a lot, particularly yesterday's piece from Josh Kim at Dartmouth, about how uh, the MOOC craze is having different effects than we might have expected during the hype uh, two years ago. Uh, that was really, really fascinating development. It's going to be exciting to see 
how what research tells us about this. That's the one component that we don't really have. You know, how much are we improving or hindering comprehension and that kind of thing through the blend of online and in-person learning. And we also have Kelvin Thompson joining us from University of Central Florida. Um, you, you know, you, your school has a kind of a longer history around blended learning with toolkits that were created, what, back in the 90s. Tell us about what you all have done there and how that's kind of evolved over the years. Hi, sure. Um, we've been offering blended courses here at UCF since the late 90s, early 2000s, and it was out, an outgrowth of our fully online course and program initiative. So the way that it's played out here at UCF institutionally is that we often conceptualize blended learning here as more of a face-to-face -face enhanced web course than a web enhanced face-to-face -face course. So we are able to take more of, a, of an institutional approach that way. But I would say that in general, uh, in higher education, blended learning is uh, a bit more pedagogically responsive, that is, individual faculty making individual choices, rather than uh, online courses and programs that tend to be more of an institutional uh, initiative. But here at UCF, it's fascinating. Blended learning outperforms online courses and face-to-face -face courses on just about every metric that we look at. Why is that, do you think? I mean, what is it about um, the blended style that's, that's so much better than both the others? Well, I mean, at this point, it's sort of cliche to say this. I'm hesitant to, to let the words come out of my mouth. But when it's done well, blended learning does represent the best of both worlds, right? The face-to-face the -face and the online. And uh, when it's not done well, it doesn't <laughs> represent the best of those both worlds. But I think that in general, um, we've, we've seen that. We've put a lot of... Um, of effort into preparing faculty and supporting them uh, as we do with our fully online courses and programs. So I think that uh, given all that support and preparation and then uh, having the, uh, the kind of the well-crafted strategic face-to-face -face placement in an online context, you, it is truly the best of both worlds. Yeah, and um, Andrew, you've also um, looked into kind of the Minerva experiment when it comes to on kind of blended learning, where they had online courses, but they also had some in-person centers around the country. I mean, what do you think about that idea where there's not even necessarily a university campus, but there might be learning centers? Yeah, I mean, I think that's an extension of what Calvin talked about, which is trying to capture the... Um, the efficiencies and the ability for students to utilize online resources and to be self-driven in learning, but also have that camaraderie and the ability to interact with uh, other individuals, whether they're taking the same course or in the same uh, learning area with, you know, kind of remote uh, campuses and little clusters of folks living in a dorm, let's say, in Singapore or somewhere else while taking classes um, over the Internet. I think that's kind of kind of a cool idea and I think that more folks experimenting in that area are going to see that that's a, it's a great mix of things. If you think about it, it's, it's very similar to a lot of what we do with meetups and why meetups and hackathons and those types of things have taken off as well is that it gives you time to be inspired by face-to-face -face interaction, sometimes planned, sometimes serendipitous, and then you go back to your, your, your place of work or your little uh, your cave, you hack on it, you try it, and you come back again and you share things um, with each other. And I think, you know, I've seen those successes in the classroom and my experience is very similar to Kelvin's in that um, I think about what I did 15 years ago in terms of taking up class time, trying to do hands-on training and fighting fires, running from workstation to workstation. It's such an inefficient use of time. And if you can get really well done training materials online and the students uh, can learn at their own pace, rewind, replay, redo, you know, in those six days between classes, then you can really utilize the in-class time for more productive things. And Mark, I know you have a story coming up for us about um, about flipping the classroom, and similar to what Andrew's talking about, tell us a little bit about what the classroom flip means. So, uh, Steve Fox, who wrote a piece uh, for the EdShift series this week, used this great phrase about extending the classroom. And, and I really love that idea because it's sort of what we were doing down here. Uh, we started with uh, video tutorials for different pieces of technology a couple of years ago. And what was really interesting is I actually started creating them, because uh, I'm the geek 
in the department, or was the geek. We've hired a few more geeks, so I don't feel so lonely anymore. Um, but we uh, we started creating them because a lot of my colleagues wanted to have different technology components in their classes, but they didn't feel comfortable teaching them. So we created this uh, digital literacy uh, for journalists series, and it was all these different pieces of technology from how to use social media and WordPress to how to record and edit audio. Um, we created a series of, I think, 15 tutorials about four years ago that my colleagues were incorporating into their classes, and they'd assign them essentially as homework. And I think if you think about flipped classrooms in that phrase, it's another one that's sort of become very popular in the last few years. But I suspect that anybody who's ever assigned homework has flipped a classroom in some way, shape, or form because it used to be you'd assign readings and now we assign videos to watch. And then you come into class and you would then discuss the readings and now you're discussing the videos and answering questions about it. The other issue that we've run into is in the last you know, 10 or 15 years, there's so much more technology involved uh, for those of us who are teaching in the journalism area and a lot of other areas that trying to figure out how do we still deal with all the critical thinking, conceptual, historical, ethical stuff, as well as teaching the new technologies. How do you fit all of that into three hours a week? You know, the idea that the classroom experience only lasts for three hours is a little silly. I mean, why not extend it as much as you can, as, as Steve Fox up at UMass said? And you mentioned, I mean, there are, you were kind of the lonely geek there, and now you're bringing in more. I mean, is, has that been one of the institutional challenges, is that if you say, let's do blended learning, that means there are some online aspects, there's some technology aspects, and sometimes both the educators and students might not be up on what's happening in those areas. You know, one of the things with that digital literacy series, the first uh, set of video tutorials I did that I was really aiming for was equalizing expertise because we'd have some students who came in who had a ton of technology knowledge and some who had none. You know, we have some students that walk in with all of their devices and others that walk in and the first thing they say is computers hate me. Uh, and an awful lot of the faculty are sort of in the same boat. There are some that are really geeky and they're willing to dive deep and on their own time during the summers, weekends, and sitting in their office, they'll play around with the software, they'll play around with some new hardware or something like that. But we all have so many different responsibilities that trying to figure out what fits and what doesn't is, is really difficult. That said, I don't want to knock all of my colleagues. We had a, a legendary professor here at the University of Georgia by the name of Conrad Fink, who unfortunately passed uh, two and a half, almost three years ago. And Conrad spent 25 years with the Associated Press and then came and taught here at Georgia for 30 years. And so here's this 78-year-old man who walked into my office one day with his iPad, and he was so excited because now the New York Times was everywhere. And so it's not really an age thing. It's not a tenure thing. It's all an attitude thing. And one of the things I love about my colleagues here is over the last couple of years, that attitude has really changed. And so we have a lot of geeky conversations in the hallway right now. Katie, do you see that too? I mean, do you think, do you think there's, a, there's something changing when it comes to technology in, um, in education? Oh, I think so. I think that fear factor is still definitely out there. Um, but I think that uh, there's more recognition that we need to change what we're teaching. And so I think there's more reaching out to say, how can we scale what you've already been doing to continue it in my class? So um, I know I need to do more with teaching uh, spreadsheets, data, uh, data cleaning, and basic functions. Hey, have you recorded one of those trainings that I could use um, in my class as well? So I think there's more collaboration to try to address the fear than I've seen before. And that's not just within one school, but across schools too? Oh, I, I see it all over the place. And I, I think it's reflected in a, a lot of the content that we've been running um, on EdShift, you know, quite a bit of pickup on pieces that are that let people remix their other um, blended learning approaches. I think that's, I think that's positive. Uh, but, you know, I'm not wearing rose-colored glasses. <laughs> um, there's, there's still, you know, I mean, we're in the middle of a massive disruption in higher education, um, largely brought on by huge cost increases. And um, I, you know, we're just beginning to feel the effects of that. Um, everybody got scared about MOOCs. The hype died down. Maybe people are a little more relaxed. But I think we're only at the beginning of this, of a very, very bumpy road. And Mark, if I can hop in. Yeah, for a please question. jump in. Uh, you know, one of the things Katie said there is that ability for us to learn, you know, through all different types of social media, through Facebook groups, through Teach a Palooza down at Pointer, through the EdShift series, through Twitter chats, through all these different things, we now have a much larger community where we can take knowledge that we have and share it with colleagues at other institutions across the country, and we can tap that and that knowledge at other institutions as well and bring it back into us. And I think once you get away from the idea that we are the experts in every single thing and start moving towards the idea of 
we need to understand these things and that learning is a lifelong process. It's going to get a whole lot easier for a lot of folks. That's true. Kelvin, did you want to jump in on that point too? I mean, what's the situation there when it comes to sharing and collaboration and, you know, how do you get all the faculty on board? Yeah, I, well, I think here's the thing. You might know this concept uh, that kind of goes by the acronym TPAC, right? There's, there's, there's content knowledge, which is a kind of a traditional uh, uh, hallmark of the university faculty member, and there's folks who get into teaching their subject area, pedagogical content knowledge, but then there's technological pedagogical content knowledge, right? The intersection of all of those those uh, circles, like a, this crazy Venn diagram, and that's tough, right? And some uh, instructors, some university or college faculty will will embrace that, uh, kind of as Mark was talking about, uh, and so then that begins to break down the discipline specific uh, walls uh, because um, we don't just talk to folks just in our content knowledge or just in our our, our, our uh, teaching of journalism or any other subject area. It's it's uh, how can we do this better? Uh, so what we try to do is um, when we do uh, faculty preparation, faculty development here at UCF, we make that a, a cross disciplinary experience, and so you get people from widely ranging discipline areas talking to each other about how teaching could be better through the application of technologies, especially web-based technologies, and that's a wonder to behold. You get people making connections within their discipline area, folks who never really talked to each other before, uh, but also cross-pollinating uh, from the social sciences to the hard sciences and so forth. It's, it's great. So that's been a real uh, secret sauce for us, or since we're in Orlando, the pixie dust that we sprinkle on everything. <laughs> of course. And Fanny was was good enough to bring up that Venn diagram and it, explaining TPAC, which is really good to see. Um, Andrew, I know you've been doing some things with a class about Wikipedia where you're actually going out to institutions in the DC area um, and including museums and things. I mean, what is the real world, kind of getting out into the real world aspect of blended learning too? Yeah, I mean, almost out of necessity because every other week when I was teaching my class, which was called Wikipedia and Public Knowledge, we had our students actually not in the classroom, but actually down the Smithsonian or down at the National Archives working with their curators to edit Wikipedia articles and to do research, which is great. But that means that's even one less day I have to do any kind of training with them. So as other folks have mentioned, a lot of this is screen recording training on Wikipedia, editing on how to deal with open content, things that are kind of intricate and you need to kind of know the ins and outs. So some of these videos were 30 to 45 minutes long, um, which are kind of hard to sit through. So if I had to give any advice to folks, I'm sure all the folks in this conversation have little bits of advice on how to do screencast better. They do take a lot of preparation. Right, you, you get a really great payoff if you give that video to 20 students, but you need to put a lot of work into it. Um, but two things I found that were really useful is one, if you can index or time code index into the video so people can jump directly to minute 23, which has the specific thing that they're looking for, I found that to be very useful for students. If you use something like Vimeo, all you need to do is just put the time code and a label into the um, description area and it automatically makes hyperlinks into the video which students really liked. The other thing which is just very simple but I never really realized until recently if you record your face with the FaceTime camera or the camera and just embed it into the lower right hand corner of the video if you have dead moments where you're not mousing around doing anything students find it much easier to watch the video because they can look at your face and see your gesticulation and explanations whereas if you you know, I, I'm a big fan of lynda.com, but, you know, you can't sit there and watch 45 minutes of just a screen. It just gets really dry and boring. So to have that instructor's face and have big eyes and move, things like that, it keeps students involved more. And I, I found that they like that as well. Yeah, what would, what would the rest of you say about the, the challenges in, let's say, preparing a, a blended learning class? I mean, typically, if you're, if you're creating a new class, you've got to think about the curriculum and what you're going to be teaching in class. Um, but does it, does it make it more tricky or more complicated to prepare for a blended learning class? Absolutely. I would say, uh, you know, Andrew's pretty cute. I'm not sure how much students want to see my face. Uh, but it, you, you, you run into a lot of unexpected problems. I mean, you get into a classroom, you're doing a lecture, 
you go a little bit off track, you can punt and recover and they never even know. And with, um, with blended learning, you're recording a training, you know that they're going to go back, they're going to relook at that, they're, gonna, they're going to uh, find your flaws. And so you have to think care very carefully about the structure. I also spend a lot of time thinking about um, what content is right for what particular format and how to do things that facilitate the students actually engaging with it. So I told you before, I learned something new in the series. I just learned something new from Andrew. I had no idea Vimeo did that hyperlink tagging. So I'll now be putting my magazine lectures off of YouTube and onto Vimeo <laughs> starting for next week. So um, there's all th that sense that everything can be changed and updated and improved. That actually ends up being kind of a burden. It can be hard to do. Yeah, and what about just getting students to, to look at the material? If you're depending on having a lot of this material online, videos, websites, social media, et cetera, um, we've seen some numbers where the students aren't necessarily getting to that material. I mean, how do you make it more appealing for them, um, Mark or Kelvin? Sure. Uh, one of the things that I found is that there has to be a loop. I can't just assign something and say, go watch this, and then walk away from it. So most of the stuff that I'm flipping that I'm putting online is software tutorial sorts of things. So my basic principle is I'm going to take all the facts, things that are not really up for discussion, and I'm going to post those online. But all of those tutorials are things that they'll then have to come into class and either talk about or prove that they have learned. So that process of figuring out what stays in the classroom and what doesn't, anything that's not up for discussion goes online. And then when they come into class, then we actually discuss it. And that gives us more time for discussions and less time of them watching me push buttons uh, in the classroom there. One of the other things that I have found is the original set of video tutorials I did ranged from 14 minutes to, I think, 30 minutes in length. And the biggest feedback that I got was that it was hard for them to, to sort of find time for it, which is a little silly. But what I've done is I've cut them down where most of mine now are between five minutes and seven minutes. Um, so if I can't get it across in five to seven minutes, then I have to break it into smaller and smaller pieces. And what's interesting is I can assign three or four five-minute ones so that they get up to 15 or 20 minutes worth of having to watch these things. No problems at all. But if I give them one 15-minute one, then they tend to grumble a little bit about it being too long. So just the fact that it stops at some point in time and then restarts seems to help quite a bit on that. So making it into kind of snackable media, basically. You know, it's, it's meeting the kids where they are as far as I'm concerned. You know, they're going to find five minutes between classes to pull out their iPhone and watch these things. Uh, they're going to find 10 minutes to pull out their tablet and watch these things. So, you know, thinking about not just when, but also on what device they're going to watch them, that controls an awful lot of the way that you put them together. But, you know, they would rather take five minutes when they've got it to get a little bit of homework done. So give it to them in a chunk that works. Kelvin, yeah. did you want to add anything, or Katie? Yeah, I would just say that based on uh, or extending what both Katie and Mark said, what what we've seen, you know, we've been the last few years packaging some of what we know at UCF about blended learning that we've developed over the last 18 years or so, sending that out to the, to the world through uh, some open courseware and some uh, smaller MOOCs, um, the BlendKit MOOCs. What we've seen in working with literally thousands of, of, in, uh, of instructional designers and faculty is that the number one blended learning design issue is integration between the face-to-face -face and the online uh, portions of the blended learning course. And while we've tended to kind of talk about one kind of blended learning uh, in our talk today here, uh, blended learning really exists on a continuum, right? And, uh, and a lot of it is driven by the individual instructor. Sometimes it's di driven by institutional definitions or uh, sort of institutional cultural expectations. But whatever it is, um, as our colleagues at uh, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee said years, years ago, there's a tendency to get into this course and a half phenomenon, right? You're going to have your regular course, then you're going to bolt on this other stuff, and you end up expecting more of students uh, than is, is rational, more than 100%. So thinking about what does redesigning this course look like to take um, full advantage of the affordances of, of the new whole uh, is, is, is deceptively uh, difficult. Um, but we actually encourage folks to even kind of map out what's face-to-face, -face, what's online, what's kind of both, and that there's a relationship. Students shouldn't have to guess at any point. How does, how does this online screencast, for instance, um, relate to uh, what you might say in class? How does an online set of interactions relate to uh, interactions on class? Are you going to expect me to do the same thing in both mediums? Well, that's dumb. You know, what are you, what are you asking me to do? So 
thinking that stuff through uh, at the beginning in a way that, that adds value for the students is, is the quintessential task of a, of a good blended learning designer. I, I couldn't agree more. I also think it's really important to have um, student accountability as part of the package. Um, there is, uh, some students have a notion, I, I think it's largely come from bad experiences with um, earlier online coursework experiences, um, maybe K through 12 isn't necessarily what they needed it to be, uh, that they ignore it, they blow it off. Um, just this past semester, we uh, asked students what was the single biggest problem with the um, blended learning in our class, these te technology trainings and ethics modules that were online, and they said the fact that other students don't do them, and then we get put into group projects. So we did a really simple thing. We had an accountability. Every time they finished a training or were supposed to finish a training, they had to fill out a Google form guaranteeing that they finished it, and that the top of the Google form said lying on this verification constitutes academic misconduct. We went to from wow. really spotty to almost 100% participation in the training. So, so there are little things you can do to be nimble and respond when you have a particular problem. That's pretty brilliant. So just putting on your rose-colored glasses, Andrew, um, where do you see this going? I mean, what what is kind of the where does this fit into the future of education? I mean, are we done with these big lectures halls with just students sitting around and listening to a professor at the front? I mean, what what do you see happening in five to ten years? Um, well, you know, I'm I'm more the pessimistic side. I mean, I'm optimistic about the techniques. I'm optimistic about smart folks that we have in our conversation here. But in terms of institution wise. Uh, you know, I am lucky or unlucky enough to have been part of two universities that where they had a moratorium on MOOCs. Basically, they said, MOOCs coming down the highway, stop. We should not do anything like that whatsoever. Um, so I do, I am concerned that most universities are like that and that if within these institutions, if you wanted to try to get this change to happen, to uh, experiment with these or to, you know, use their... Uh, use these methods on a large scale, um, the systems that we have at universities are not good for this, right? So the, the most innovative faculty you have in terms of adjuncts, professional practice, um, folks in residence are not part of the power structure and tenured faculty who think in decades and multiple decades at a time and not a year or a month um, are not eager to try these things out. So that's what I worry about. And as the price of a four-year education, you know, is north of $200,000, um, this is just not sustainable for the long term. So are the big universities nimble enough to recognize this and pivot quickly enough to uh, pay attention? Because, you know, the product is as expensive as ever. Are the students getting the value out of that? It's not clear that they are. Yeah, yeah I, okay. I would well, say you that the you product don't have your rose colored glasses then. Um, yeah, not those. <laughs> Katie, what were you going to well, say? Sorry, I was going to say the product is, is more expensive than it's ever been. Um, you know, as, as Mark knows well, I am I, I'm a little emotional today because I ship my kid off to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in the morning. Um, and I graduated from the University of Wisconsin in 1988, and his tuition in today, my tuition then in today's dollars, we've seen a 200% increase. I can guarantee you he's not getting a 200% better education. Uh, but my experience differs from Andrew a little bit. Um, we do have some of our heavy hitter tenure track faculty who have been very innovative in this space because they see it as one way that they can manage teaching against research and service as part of their mission. So, you know, we've got you know, we've got people in school of medicine and public health, people, you know, we've got a biologist here who has been experimenting with blended learning. You know, <laughs> he's been evolving, I like to say. Um, so I don't think it's it's all dark. I'm not a pessimist, but like I said, I I don't have the rose-colored glasses on either. I think we're at this. We're at the start of a really disruptive time, and there's just a there are just a lot of questions that are going to be difficult to answer. For sure. So thanks a lot. I think it's been a really good discussion, and it's something we'll be covering a lot on EdShift at EdShift.org and on MediaShift. And I appreciate all of you joining us. Um, Andrew Lee from American University, our producer Fanny Cohen in New York, Katie Culver, our EdShift curator. Kelvin Thompson at UCF, and Mark Johnson at University of Georgia. We want to thank our sponsors, Squarespace. Go to squarespace.com slash media shift and use the media shift code to get 10% off on building websites. And also um, Next Space, Potrero Hill, 
Next Space and Next Kids. Um, go to bit.ly slash nextspaceph to learn more about their pioneering program. Uh, we'll catch you each and every week on Fridays for the Media Twits. Um, thanks and have a great weekend, everyone.